don't know if you guys noticed yesterday during Wilbur's first steps episode that he was jerking to a stop on some of the commands. They weren't coming to a kind of gradual rolling stop as they should. Basically, I wasn't sure kind of what was causing it, but it was a bug in the code and it's been squashed so we can tackle something fun today. Right now, the servos are really just mounted and wired up, but there's no programming and they don't have any function as part of Rover's drive programming. In taking that step forward, what we need to do is disconnect these two and put in some mechanics to allow that to rotate. Now, that actually creates a problem with how I've designed Rover, and that's what I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about. In designing Rover, I positioned the wheels outside of his main chassis and not directly below the servos. It was a look that I wanted. It was aesthetics. I didn't appreciate the complexity that it would introduce in Rover's turning mechanisms. With the Mars Rover design, you can see that the tires are directly below the servos that turn the tires, that turn the wheels. The tire doesn't have to turn in a radius, it can turn on its axis. In Rover's case, however, if the servo turns, rotates here on this axis, then this tire will want to rotate around in a circle, in a radius, around. So basically kind of like this, as opposed to turning on itself. When I was designing Rover, I didn't appreciate why NASA went about it the way they did. Of course, now I see their logic and you know they're NASA for a reason. <laughs> if these are rotated and held in place by the servos in whichever orientation, then the servo is constantly at work in trying to keep that straight because as Rover rolls forward, these will want to basically roll back. And conversely, if Rover rolls backwards, these will want to rotate around forward. The servos are going to be tr struggling to try to keep these in a fixed position to the side. So here's a little diagram. So if Rover begins to move in this direction, then the force on the wheels, they're going to be driving forward, but the force on the axis on the center point will actually be pushing the wheel backwards. So even though it's rotating forward, it'll want to spin in an arc, in a radius, backwards like this. Similarly, if then even though these wheels will be rotating, you know, driving in that direction in order to, to drive him that way, the force on the wheels will be backwards and they're going to want to swing back around. So I've got two options. One is a redesigned rover such that the servos are directly over top of the wheels so that we avoid this problem to begin with and we take NASA's approach. Unfortunately, that sacrifices one of the coolest aspects of the design, which is that the wheels can change orientation and we get that sort of tumbler look that I personally really love. The other option is that I figure out a way by which to relieve some of the strain on the servos so that they're not constantly struggling to keep the wheels in their orientation when Rover's driving in any particular direction. Guess which option I'm preferring. Well, first things first. First, we gotta disconnect the leg so that we can play with some options around how to make it work. start with the one wheel for now because it's such a pain to, to disconnect them. I wanted to show you guys some of the parts that I'll be testing, trying to figure out exactly how to make this um, turning mechanism work inside each of Rover's legs. So these are different types of clamping hubs. Here we've got uh, just a separate bearing, flange bearing. Uh, so the flange, for example, if you slide it in, to one of these, it doesn't pop out the other side, um, but rotates freely. Um, here we've got a mounted bearing, uh, basically different, different ways of mounting the bearings. And this one in particular is useful because it won't slide out in either direction, whereas this one will fall out obviously in one direction, but not the other. 
And here we've got the actual shaft. So you can see it's a D shaft, it's flat on one edge. And that, for example, works in conjunction with a set screw hub like this. And you can see in the photos that I've posted here of the shaft mounted inside the servo that it works based on the set screw as well. And you tighten down the set screw in order to lock it in place. The problem with this, with a set screw approach like this is it holds it from rotating like this. It prevents it from rotating like this. However, it doesn't really provide a terrible amount of friction um, vertically this way. And that's another issue that I need to address. What we're looking at here is the one that I still have connected. Um, here's the one that we just disconnected. But what you can imagine is that once it's disconnected and we have inside here uh, a bearing or a set of bearings that are allowing it to rotate, if, for example, I go to pick up Rover or, for example, he rolls over something where the ground falls out from below one of the wheels, there's going to be a pull on the shaft inside the servo and there's got to be a, a way by which we lock down these things from actually separating because the friction of a set screw isn't really sufficient enough to hold the pieces together this way. So even though it'll, it'll hold it for the purposes of rotating the wheel, it won't hold it a, a vertical force. We don't have to worry about vertical force upward, of course, because that's just holding it everything together, but it's the vertical force downward from the weight of the tire and the, especially the motor that, that could theoretically pull the motor out from the servo shaft. So as you guys can probably tell, I've got a whole bunch of extra parts that I purchased from two years ago, uh, because apparently I was trying to figure out kind of how I would actually implement this. So I've got even different D shafts of different lengths, of varying lengths. Um, with the approach that I'm thinking of right now, I'm gravitating towards the shorter length shaft. One reason is the weight. These are uh, stainless steel. They're quite substantial in weight. Um, almost everything else is aluminum, so it saves them a lot of weight. Even so, Rover is not exactly a lightweight. Um, and what I'm thinking of is inserting the shaft into the servo sleeve and then mounting, I'm not yet sure of the orientation, this shaft clamp. Uh, it doesn't have a set screw, but in this particular case, I actually want to use a clamping hub so that I can apply much greater frictional force on the shaft to overcome that vertical force that I had mentioned earlier. So I wanna get this mounted and then use a bearing in conjunction with this to alleviate the, the friction from the turning. This would then counteract the vertical forces acting on the shaft and prevent that there from being any kind of tug and pull on the servo. So even though I don't yet have the shaft inside the servo sleeve, you can see that the friction of this clamping hub actually prevents me from being able to pull vertically down on the shaft, which is exactly what we're after. Okay, so I've run into a problem. So this approach is not going to work, even though it solves the vertical forces problem. This particular clamping hub is, is so broad that even though I tried two different head screws, as you can see in the photo, it just doesn't quite clear when I rotate it. You can hear that clicking. Yeah, I just don't think the clearance is sufficient. So this brings us back to the set screw approach, which I have my doubts about, but just from playing around with it, it takes quite a bit of force just to get this inside, even with the, the set screw completely free. I mean, the set screw is completely out and it takes a lot of force just to drive this in or vice versa to remove it. It takes a lot of force. So the friction, the tolerances in these in this design, and these are from Servo City. And so I, I think that might be sufficient between the force, the, the friction here and the friction in the servo shaft, it might be enough to do the trick. So we've got it now mounted with the set screw hub on there. And it's difficult to hold with my fingers, but 
It can rotate now. Gotta love that servo sound. <laughs> because of this pushing against the bearing, the flange bearing that we saw in there, we've got that vertical pull um, addressed. So basically the weight of the wheel and motor shouldn't pull the shaft out of the servo. So the next part of it that we have to figure out, of course, is the mounting of lower motor shaft onto the servo shaft and uh, figure out how to clamp that on as well. As you can see, we were just about ready to mount the motor to the servo shaft. I'm hesitant to do that yet. It's been two years since I played with the servos and I know I do remember one thing, which is that servos have rotational positioning. I mean, that's what makes them a servo. They know where they are in their rotation. These particular servos are a bit special because they, they can do a full 360. They can do even more than 360 degrees, which is actually rare for servos if you know anything about servos. That being said, I need to know where the servo is right now within its rotational path, its maximum minimum, so that I know when I mount the, the, the wheel that it's going to still be able to get around to all the points that I need it to be able to reach. So rather than mount the motor right now, I'm actually inclined to test the software side of things and get a handle on controlling the servos so that I know that when we do mount the motor, it's mounted in the correct position within the servos turning logic. We went to all that trouble yesterday to get the tires on and look for over now. At least there's some comfort in knowing that we're working on his turning functionality. So if you're interested in that, join us tomorrow. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe to get notified. Um, if you have comments, please leave them below or on Rover's site. Till then, cheers.